My name is Allie. My name is Brittany. I'm Chisa. And we are an incubator that connects students to community stakeholders um, to implement projects and services that directly benefit the environment. We are a net zero community incubator. Incubator because of the, um, we're a team of people that cultivate ideas and deliver actions into a community. Um, net zero uh, for zero emissions, our ultimate aim is to develop a community that is, has no environmental impact. So about cella, um, first just to start off with what the word means. Um, it's a Latin word used to, de used to describe the inner chamber of a temple. Um, and it's also the root word, it was coined by biologists in the 17th century, um, cell, um, the root word of cell, which is the basic unit living, um, basic unit of all living organisms. So there's this inherent history uh, between science and um, religion. And, and it just so happens that our, our first, our primary partner and our client is actually a church this semester. Net zero, again, means zero emissions and no environmental impact. And um, so we've designated and we've created um, a research field site for new school students and for faculty um, within this semester. And again, our ultimate, our ultimate aim is to create a net zero community um, and to also have a physical structure, a net zero structure um, that applies passive house principles, um, which is the highest um, energy efficiency principles standards for construction. Um, and as to quote Joel Towers, you invest in developing a net zero community and then the structure comes after. So this semester we've really, really focused on establishing those partnerships and creating um, a net zero community uh, in the structure following. Here's a few of the students in front of our um, primary site um, and, and the cl our client, which is a church in Greenpoint uh, with a quote from Joel Towers. And um, some of our core team members, Brittany and I, um, Nerman Kajosi, which is a Greenpoint resident, and he's kind of our facilities manager. He's our go-to guy. Um, and this is a few of our students um, in, front of the in front of the church. And we have students that are ranging from um, across four different schools within the university. So within one semester, we have organized uh, students from Parsons, Lang, NSP, and NSSR across 10 different departments from religious studies and foundation year students to transdisciplinary design students um, at Parsons. And three faculty um, have been involved with this this semester, including myself. Um, in total, we have 44 students within this semester that have worked with our research field site and worked with our community partners. And they've all been organized in four different teams, structure, garden, messiah development, and communications. And within this semester, they have, we have made um, over 15 field visits to Greenpoint, to our site, um, and service, uh, service days at Messiah. So those both have been as a group and um, independently. Um, by the end of the semester, we will have completed uh, 100 one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and with our community partners in order to make all these deliverables happen. Some of our services, our students are dedicated um, working with our community partners to really deliver these real results in the community. Um, so one way of doing that is by having these service days where the students are actually working in the field and work with our community partners. Um, soil sampling, um, so soil sampling is something we offer to homeowners where we connect them with the, the soil lab in Brooklyn, um, we'll analyze the results and then we'll actually help them, provide them education on ways to improve their soil based off of any contamination, um, basic methods to improve our compost, sunflowers and um, mushrooms. Um, developing Community Garden is another service we have, and we've already started one with our primary client, the church in Greenpoint. Um, structural renovations, um, easy small renovations to existing structures um, in order to make it more energy efficient. Again, reaching for that ultimate aim of creating a net zero structure. Um, and educational workshops, which we've also provided um, this semester on soil, um, soil sampling methods of bioremediation, um, bioregional mapping, and energy retrofits. 
some of our work that are divided within these teams, communications, garden, mapping, and structure. So all students across the classes um, did preliminary stages in mapping um, and their own research. So Shisun here has actually um, mapped out Greenpoint organizations. Um, and, and there's just some information about her. Um, there's also information in the back that's printed out. Um, this is a GIS map on contaminants um, done by a student, Charlie, in our Sustainable Urban Communities class here. So again, this was like establishing research and, and making themselves familiar with this field site before going in and doing work. Um, we have a community garden that we started at the front lot of Messiah, which is the church in Greenpoint. We planted sunflowers just this past weekend. Um, again, sunflowers help to improve the soil, and then we'll have uh, raised beds um, for edibles. Um, there's the seed incubator. We've been partnered, one of our primary partners is also La Petite Garden, which is a local um, gardening consulting business in Greenpoint. Um, so Marjana, our master gardener, um, was housing these seeds, um, and a lot of students helped plant them. We've already planted over 160 seeds. Um, and then our structural renovations, uh, we're looking to do small renovations with the floors, the walls, and the lighting fixtures within the church. And, oops, I'm just going to go back. And one, another one of the, within the structure team, another one of the renovations, sorry, I know I'm, wrapping it up here, is we're refurbishing pews. We've already broken down five pews and refurb refurbishing them to create a community table where then worship will be held at on Sunday evenings, um, where they will be serving local produce from the farmer's market, which we also table and promote our events at every Sunday. Um, so just real quickly, Sorry, thank you for giving me a little more time if I'm already over it. Um, our upcoming events, we have a service day tomorrow and then the following Saturday. Um, two energy retrofit workshops um, in April and then in May. And our largest event, which is the end of the semester celebration, really, of all of the students' work, where it would exhibit and showcase their work. There will be presentations, workshops, and there will be vendors and tabling and, and music. Um, so it's really, it's a Cella and Messiah Community Bazaar, and it will be held at uh, Messiah Church, uh, 129 Russell Street. All the flyers, you have one at every table. That's the green flyer. They're also posted on the columns. Um, and uh, we'll be sending around a listserv if you would like to know more information. Um, also, this is just a map from one of the students that, uh, two of the students that facilitated a bioregional mapping project or workshop at Messiah, and that was the result of um, our community and student efforts from that workshop. So those are just a, a few of our different projects this semester. Thank you. Any questions for them? Questions? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Good question. Um, a tremendous amount of support from the students and from faculty, um, and we've had initial meetings with deans and directors, including Joel Towers, who have offered their support for it, and um, uh, the university really wants to have sustained partnership with a community, um, and that's really been an issue from semester to semester to continue and kind of sustain these project-based um, different partnerships and to allow students to have that, that established community partnership um, every semester and, and every year. So I know that's been an issue and this is, this is a real solution to that. We've established these, these strong partnerships and we've created deliverables within this semester. Um, to that question though, we have not received a, a single dollar for doing any of this. Um, we are managing 44 students right now for no cost, which has been an incredible process and we really owe it all to our students and to our community partners who are also offering their, their time, um, they're donating materials, the seeds were donated, every, every material on here has been donated or, or salvaged. Um, but yeah, part of the objective tonight is to really um, present our case um, for the university to invest in it. Um, this is a clear opportunity for um, a sustained partnership with community and to really have a designated research field site that also is linked to a larger vision. Um, so it seems like a pretty clear, obvious thing that we should invest in, even a few thousand dollars. 
uh, semester. Thanks, Rob. Good question. Any other questions? Cool. Great. So moving right along, our next presentation will be from Jessica, and she will be presenting on food, sexual violence, and memory. And just a reminder, please, again, make sure you're writing down your favorites. Just remind yourself so at the end we can tab those votes and get those votes in. Thank you. The world works in approximately seven billion ways. Through seven billion pairs of eyes and mouths are stories waiting to be heard and seen. Today I'm interested in four million of those stories. First of all, I'm Jessica. By day, I'm an analyst at the US Attorney's Office, but in real life, I'm a writer and I'm an activist. I sit on the board of directors for SAFER, which uh, is Students Active for Ending Rape, a nonprofit that works with college activists who are seeking sexual assault policy reform on their campuses. I write about food, memory, and violence, and this quick presentation is a glimpse into my work and the real life experiences that inform and inspire my writing. I'm a Latina, I'm a daughter, a granddaughter, a sister, and a cousin. And I want to talk to you about a world unfamiliar to most of us, myself included. My grandparents immigrated here from the Dominican Republic in the late 60s to escape oppression at the hands of Trujillo. And I'm immensely privileged and thankful for all the opportunities I've been given that they've never had. One of those privileges means I get to walk into a restaurant and supermarket and think only of my immediate interaction with the food I eat. When was the last time you sat in a restaurant or walked into a supermarket and thought about all of the hands that have touched your food? The names of the people who processed your chicken, beef, or fish. I don't believe in isolated experiences. I believe in a massive web of connections and lives that are connected in ways we sometimes don't even bother to imagine. We start with the runner if you're at a restaurant. Then the line cooks, before that, maybe a commissary or a distributor. Before that, the dude who packed your truck uh, with all of the food from wherever, uh, the workers who packaged the food. And before that, the farmer in Iowa or California who plucked said food off the land. At a supermarket, this chain of connections is slightly different, but not by very much. There are approximately 10.8 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, according to the H Department of Homeland Security. Women make up 4 million of these folks. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, they're the backbone of our food supply. 80% of 150 Latina women surveyed by Irma Morales Wolf for Violence Against Women report some form of sexual harassment working in the fields of California's Central Valley, while roughly half of the entire workplace workforce reported at least one incident. The kitchen is, quote, as domestic and setting as it is inherently political in its importance, said John O'Neill in his piece entitled Food, Sex, and Violence, a Colonizing Feminism in Caribbean Literature. We're talking about a movement towards a sustainable future today, but it isn't fully motivating or activating a massive cohort of silenced people, and we need to seek out those stories. Someone once said the job of a journalist is to go to where the silence is. Well, I'd like to engage that and complicate it a bit further, imploring all of you as activists to go to where the silence is, to listen, to engage and to recognize the experiences of undocumented Latinas, Latina food workers as text informed by systemic racism, sexism, xenophobia, and discrimination. If we want a more sustainable food system, we must start with the first pair of hands pulling fruits from the earth. Those hands that belong to millions of women terrified of being assaulted by their supervisors, continue through food processing plants, where an overwhelming amount of undocumented women are expected to cut up to 900 chicken breasts an hour, 
while being groped or harassed by the men who hold their fates in their grimy, misogynist hands. 60% of agricultural workers are undocumented. In food processing alone, we're talking about a quarter of workers who butcher and process meat, fish, poultry, they're undocumented. In restaurants, one in five cooks are undocumented. More than a quarter of dishwashers are undocumented, according to the Pew Hispanic Survey. Since I'm an analyst, I'm obligated to throw some case law at you. In 2002, Jose Castro, an undocumented worker, participated in a union organized campaign against unfair, can I have like two and a half minutes? Is that okay? Thank you. At Hoffman Plastics, a small business in Paramount, California, that manufactures plastic pipework and polyvinyl resins. Three years later, the National Labor Relations Board found that Hoffman Plastics was in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. In a 5-4 Supreme Court decision, the court found that workers must have authorization to work in the U.S. in order to be protected by the law. This landmark case made it significantly easier for big ag to continue its systemic dehumanization of its workers. So let's imagine briefly what it would be like every day to work on a farm as a Latina, undocumented. The nature of farm work makes women more susceptible to harassment and abuse. They're isolated in fields, and they depend on men for assignments, continued employment, and evaluation. And they face, they have no immediate protection by the law, from the law. What I'm suggesting is a change in how we imagine food activism by relocating the experiences of those on the margins at the center of our conversations about building a better food system. Use these experiences and stories as texts, and remember we're talking about fellow human beings. Those who have been silenced, those whose bodies and humanity have been ripped away from them in the fields where our meals begin. As a Latina, I remember and find myself through food. What I eat is a commentary of my values, my culture, and relationship to the world around me. The point is there are so many stories yet to be told that are valuable because those shared experiences are quite easily the roadmap towards sustainable progress. While each person's individual may experience may be unique, it is all informed and reaffirmed by consistent systemic denial of our food workers' humanities. As Edward R. Murrow said in 1960's CBS broadcast, Harvest of Shame, quote, the migrants have no lobby, only an enlightened, aroused and perhaps angered, public opinion can do anything about the migrants. The people you have seen have the strength to harvest your fruit and vegetables. They do not have the strength to influence legislation, but we do. Thank you. Are there any questions? Questions? We can talk later too, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Alrighty, up next we'll have uh, Danielle who will present on urban soundscapes. Just quickly a reminder as we're wrapping up here to make sure that you remember that all the plates, cups, etc. are compostable and to please put those in the compostable bin. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Um, I'm Danielle. I'm a double contemporary music and environmental studies major at Lang. I'm in my second year, and my project is one that really combines both of those concepts together into soundscaping. So by definition, a soundscape is a sound or a combination of sounds that arises from an immersive environment. And what that's referring to is both um, natural acoustic environmental sounds like I was mentioning earlier, such as animal sounds and sounds of weather, as well as environmental sounds created by humans, which is music composition and conversation in general, as well as sound design. There are two types of sound, soundscapes, such as hi-fi and lo-fi, and the difference really is that a hi-fi soundscape is one where the resolution of natural sound is higher. So say if you were in a woodland area, like a forest, you would obviously have a higher resolution soundscaping than in a place like New York City. Um, it also 
is offers a cultural sustainability in a way as it allows us to listen and hear the natural sounds of the environment which were intended as it blocks out noise from the outside with use of things like green walls or trees and fountains as well as noise cancellation. Um, and what people don't realize is that there is a huge difference between sound and noise. All noise is sound, but not all sound is noise. And basically, noise is described as an unpleasant sound that causes a disturbance, which is a huge health risk because physically, when you think about it, the average adult human ear can hear around 140 decibels. And because our ears are so sensitive, um, what we hear is twice as loud as what we're really hearing. And it's scary because at 125 decibels, your eardrums can actually completely be damaged. And when you think about it, an ambulance is 120 decibels when it's passing you. And to put into, I guess, perspective, those five decibels that could take you from 120 to 25, um, a whisper itself is 30 decibels, so it's not that much of a difference between 120 and 125. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and mentally, noise has been known to cause stress, which also is a huge health risk and leads to other health conditions. There are three types of noise pollution. There's unwanted sound, unmusical sound, and really loud sounds that cause disturbances. Um, wait, not yet. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. Um, this is a picture of a soundscape that was built in Miami. It's called Lincoln Park a couple years ago um, by designer Frank Gehry. And it's three acres, I believe. And um, it's also, it's on a campus. So it's also a place where the students say build a concert hall for performers to be able to practice as well as for them to study because from personal experience, a musician is highly prone, more prone than anyone else really to hearing loss as just because a room is soundproof, a performance space or a rehearsal hall, that doesn't mean that the acoustics inside are completely blocking out the noise for it. So it's still highly, if from the outside, you won't be able to hear that noise, but there is frequency that bounces off of your instruments. So anyone else is inside you're still highly at risk of losing your hearing. Um, this is a green wall, which would, could be used for an indoor soundscape. You can't really plant trees inside, obviously. So green walls, small fountains, bird baths are typical things that you'll find inside of a soundscape because water, obviously, it can block out, they can block out noise as well as bring in that natural sound. And bird baths lead to bring in birds in outdoors. So that's also those back, going back to that animal sound. Um, and a green wall itself can reduce sound if, depending on the size, it can be used, reduce noise, sorry, to 40 decibels lower. So this can be built anywhere. Like I have one in my room in DC. Um, you, that can be professionally done, but it's really not that hard to create. And so a place like New York City is especially, could be beneficial to having soundscapes because um, I was mentioned to a few people earlier that we don't have in all areas places like Botanical Gardens or Central Park that have those natural soundscapes of those trees and fountains and things that are strategically placed for you to block out like the outside noise of the traffic and construction and everything. So an indoor soundscape would also be beneficial because not only can you create a room that is soundproof and has great indoor acoustics, but you can also control the climate change inside, which you can't really do with an outdoor environment if it's snow or rain or anything like that. So um, that's basically it. But I also had a song, I mean, two um, soundscaping songs that would go inside of an indoor soundscape, but I'm not sure if I have enough time to, OK, I have to actually open them, though. You sure? <laughs> I mean, I have to go through my, I have to go through my email. It was going to take a minute. How do you turn off the monitor? Like really fast.
just about my email. Oh, hey, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I was like, uh. Thanks. <laughs> you know, you all get a personal access to my email. I guess a little background about this one first is really more of a experimental between mixing music composition and the natural sounds of the natural acoustic environment into one composition. So. And one other note, <laughs> thank you. Um, those sounds weren't software natural sounds. I actually recorded a, a bird and then I watched like a couple YouTube videos because obviously there's no coyotes that I could walk up to and record them. So yeah, um, just that one or is that it? Oh, okay. This, <laughs> um, this one is does not have natural sounds in it. It's more of my interpretation of the wind through wind instruments, so. Sorry, <laughs> that wasn't it.
any questions? Questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I've done this. I think I start off with um, instruments. I've been playing the violin for 10 years and guitar for seven, percussion for six, but I've really gotten into music software for about, I guess, the past four years. So, yeah, that's that. Great. Perfect. Okay, our fourth and final presentation for the day will be Alexandra, and she will be doing a really unique presentation on the mind and body. Take on. 